mouths are, are to be wellsprings of life. Our words are supposed to bring health and healing. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. All these things are through this book. And if there's anything that we should be able to come out of this series with, it's a conviction that we have to be careful what we say. Well, hello there. Welcome back. Uh, today we get to uh, take a look at uh, Proverbs chapter 10. And there's a couple themes here uh, that I want to um, uh, address. Number one is desire. And um, number two is what the blessing of the Lord looks like. All right, so we're going to look at those two things. Number one is desire. Um, we're going to start with verse three. It says, the Lord will not allow the righteous soul to famish. The Lord will not allow the righteous soul to famish, but he casts away the desire of the wicked. I, I'm fascinated by the contrast that Solomon makes in his, his Proverbs. He contrast themes that, that don't always automatically appear to gel or to fit. And so here he says, he, he won't allow the righteous soul, the emotional part of their life, of our life, the soul, the intellectual part of our life to be to famish, to be uh, in a drought, to be unfit. He won't allow that to happen. He wants every part of our internal world to be nourished. And then he contrasts it with, um, he casts away the desire of the wicked. The Lord, the Lord finds, um, I wish I had better language for this. Let me just quote uh, 3 John verse 2. It says, he says, I pray, beloved, that you'd be in health and that you would uh, be abundant in all, all things, even as your soul prospers. That you would prosper, that you would be in health, even as your soul prospers. So what the scripture focuses on, the health of our internal world. And the health of our internal world makes it possible for us to be trustworthy with an abundant external world because they don't own us. They don't control us. The management of the heart has taken place well here. I can thrive with or I can thrive without because my, my life is not derived from what I own or the position or title uh, that I have. I hope that makes sense. So here it says, the Lord will not allow the internal workings of the righteous person. He will not allow that one to be famished. That encourages me because it means that he has made available abundant resource necessary for my internal world to be healthy, for my emotions to be healthy, for my intellect to be healthy. Do you know why people lose the ability to think creatively? It's because they, they carry so many things in anxiety in their mind, so many details to try to remember, so many problems to try to fix, so many things that they fear. And that's the enemy's attempt to disengage us from our assignment and privilege to create, to represent him well with creative, fresh ideas. And it's anxiety and fear that kills that in us. And so here the Lord says, all right, here's the righteous soul. I'm going to make sure that the righteous soul never famishes, never experiences a drought, never experiences um, starving. Instead, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to make sure the desires of the wicked have no place, but I'm going to feed this one. And uh, the New Testament equivalent of that is that I pray that you prosper and be in good health, even as you're healthy on the inside. I pray it shows up in the outside. All right, let's move over to uh, verse um, 11. Verse 11 says, The mouth of the righteous is a well of life, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. Take the first phrase. It would be interesting for all of us just to go through the book of Proverbs just when it talks about our speech, just about our mouth, what we have to say, um, uh, that our, mouth, our mouths are, are to be wellsprings of life. Our mouths, our words are supposed to bring health and healing. Uh, life and death is in the power of the tongue. All these things are through this book. And if there's anything that we should be able to come out of this series with, it's a conviction that we have to be careful what we say. We have to be careful what we say. We have to be careful what, we're, what we pronounce over people. We have to be careful the kinds of things that we declare because we can be so angry or upset or offended or whatever and say things that that have such lasting effect on people. 
And uh, we've got to be careful to make sure that we speak words of life. So here it is. The mouth of the righteous is a well of life. It's constantly replenished. A well isn't just, you just don't fill a well with water. It has a spring that keeps it uh, filled uh, with water. So we have this spring of life within us that makes it possible for us to always have words that encourage and strengthen other people. All right, let's move on down. Uh, wisdom, verse 13 says, wisdom is found on the lips of those who have understanding, uh, which I, I love the statement. Uh, verse 16, the labor of the righteous leads to life. That's interesting. The labor, the hard work, you know, working out in your yard or uh, the job that you have, the nine to five, whatever it might be, there's something about that labor that brings life into your life if what we do, we actually do is under the Lord. I want to encourage you that one. Take what you do, give it as under the Lord, and it actually replenishes your soul. It actually is a part of the, the tool, the program that God has created to bring refreshing and strength to us. All right, let's move on down to verse 21. The lips of the righteous feed many, there we are again, but fools die for lack of wisdom. The lips of the righteous feed many. The lips of the righteous, from the mouth of righteous people, there is an abundance of food, of nourishment for the soul. Let's move on down to verse 22. It says, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. I'm actually, let's see, I, I think I'll end uh, this one today with this verse. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. All over this world, we have business people, we have athletes and actors and actresses and CEOs and all kinds of people that seem to have unlimited resources, but all that wealth comes with great sorrow. They lost their family in the process. They sacrificed the well-being of their family for their occupation or for their position. They sacrificed friends. They sacrificed their personal standards and morals. When God blesses, there's no sorrow attached. There's no balloon payment. <coughs> Excuse me. I pray that for you, that everyone watching would taste of the blessing of the Lord in such a way that there's no sorrow added. When you work and your labor improves your city, you're providing a service, you're providing goods, you're growing wheat. In this example, you are pumping gas, uh, whatever it might be, you're providing a service for your city. God considers that to be generosity. This doesn't say blessed will be on the head of the guy who grows wheat and he gives it away. That's fine, but that's not the lesson. Hello there. Well, welcome back. Glad uh, that you could join us. Uh, we're going to look today at chapter 11. And uh, there's a portion at the end of chapter 11 that just excites me. And I'll explain it to you when we get there. But this is a chapter where we get to look once again at the role of wisdom in city life. And uh, where I want to start is verse 2. It says, when pride comes, then comes shame. But here's the phrase, with the humble is wisdom. It's important it's important that in our thinking, we think in terms that humility and wisdom are connected. Because if we, if, we learn, if we learn what is connected in the kingdom, we'll learn to value the right things. It, it's not just wisdom. It's that I value humility. It's not just wisdom. I value understanding. I value insight. I value favor, all these other things. <clears throat> so with the humble, it's wisdom. Now, let's jump down to verse 10. It says, when it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. Now, think with me for a minute. <clears throat> All of us live in cities. And when it goes well, it's the reason you should pray for uh, your, your uh, friends, the righteous friends that you have that own a business or perhaps a medical practice or <clears throat> they're an accountant in a firm. Or, it doesn't matter. Where, wherever their place in life is, a school teacher that we pray for them to be visibly blessed of the Lord in that place. Why? <clears throat> because it says, when it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. I don't know how this works, but somehow, you know, everybody, um, 
it's, it's easier to celebrate somebody else's victory when we know that they live a righteous lifestyle. It's hard to celebrate, harder to celebrate somebody's victory when we know they're devious and they're deceptive and they steal and they, you know, they're dishonest. It's hard to rejoice for those people. But when we see, oh, that person has been so faithful for so long and look what has happened to their life. This says joy is brought to a whole city, a whole city when the righteous are doing well. So it's, it's a real good reason to pray for the righteous, to be uh, honored, blessed, increased. It goes on, it says, verse 11, it says, by the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted. So not only does it have access to kingdom joy, it actually is promoted. Think about that. When the righteous are blessed of the Lord in a community, the entire community comes into a promotion. And that's that's amazing to me because I love to think in terms of city transformation. So how does it happen? Well, there's a lot of great things we could do. We serve, we love, we care, we feed the poor. We do all these things. Those are important. But here's another one. You drive by a gas station owned by a brother, sister in the Lord. You pray for them to prosper. Why? It's the way God wants to promote your city. It's the way he wants to release another level of joy to your entire city because the righteous are doing well. Because the righteous will use the favor for good purpose, all right? So it says, blessing of the upright, by the blessing of the upright, a city is exalted, but it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. That's, That's just scary to me, because there's so many destructive things that are said by the wicked in all of our cities day after day after day. And so we've got to counter that with the favor and the blessing of the Lord on the upright. All right, go with me, if you will, now to the end of the chapter. <clears throat> and this is just a personal uh, favorite, a, a place I love to talk to our students about is this uh, set of three verses here. <clears throat> go to verse 24, <clears throat> excuse me. It says, there is one who scatters, yet increases all the more. Now, first of all, understand this, you'll, you'll see it'll become clear in a moment. This is talking about generosity. It's talking about having a generous heart, that we scatter and yet we increase, all right? So here it is. There's one who scatters yet increases all the more. There's one who withholds more than what is right. So you can see withholding is contrasted with scattering. So the concept is generosity. There's one who withholds more than what is right, but it leads to poverty. <clears throat> Next verse, 20, uh, verse 25. The generous soul will be made rich. Now again, it's the soul. It's not talking about money. The internal world gets healthy. That's what brings the external blessing. So the generous soul will be made rich. He who waters will himself be watered. So what is the theme here? The theme is generosity. It's a heart posture of of generosity. Here's what's fascinating to me. Verse 26. The people will curse him who withholds grain, but blessing will be on the head of him who sells it. I love this verse. Cursed will be the one who withholds grain. In other words, let's say we're in a farming community and I I raise wheat and I harvest my wheat, but I don't want to sell it to you. The Bible says I'm cursed for that. But then it says I'm blessed if I sell it. Now, what's the context here? The context is generosity. Here's what I want you to see. When you work and your labor improves your city, you're providing a service, you're providing goods, you're growing wheat. In this example, you are pumping gas, uh, whatever it might be, you're providing a service for your city. God considers that to be generosity. This doesn't say <clears throat> blessed will be on the head of the guy who grows wheat and he gives it away. That's fine, but that's not the lesson. God is actually interested in a person producing in this case, a crop, producing a crop and being appropriately rewarded for their labor. That is God's design. This whole nonsense of everything coming to us from the government is actually from the pit of hell. I'm telling you, it weakens the identity. It weakens the assignment that God's given to us to work and to be rewarded from our labor. That's the design of the Lord. And God actually considers the person who gives themselves to grow a crop 
and then sell it at a fair price. God counts that as generosity, and he says they're going to be rewarded for it. That's amazing to me, that God thinks of being productive in that way in the same light as generosity. It doesn't mean I grow a crop, I make an income, and now I don't have to give because I've, I've been, uh, you know, I've provided a service for the community. It's just all a part of this nature of a generous lifestyle that I want to do something with my life that makes my city better. So I pray that for you. I pray that, uh, that this would just stand out, that each of us could delight in the beauty of earning an honest income, having it being the reward of the Lord, no shame involved in it, delight in it, because God has honored your generosity. Chapter 12 is fascinating because it talks once again a lot about our speech. So join us for that one. Every one of us were designed to have hearts that were happy and filled with life, overflowing with joy. That's the design of the Lord for us. Part of that is stay away from anxiety. You learn to deal with fear effectively. You deal with fear by coming into the Word of God to find out what He says. And then the good Word makes the heart glad. Well, hello there. Welcome back. Glad uh, that you could join us. Uh, chapter 12 is a rich chapter. They all are, let's be honest. But it's a rich chapter in that it always stands out to me because of how often He talks about the fruit of our, our words, the impact of our speech. We've been... We've been uh, tampering with the subject a little bit in the last few chapters, but we hit it pretty strong with a couple uh, rich verses here. But let's start um, with verse 2 of chapter 12. It says, A good man obtains favor from the Lord, a man of wicked intentions he will condemn. A good man obtains favor from the Lord. Why is this significant? <clears throat> I, think, I think many people fail to reach their their destiny, their purpose in life, because they did not realize they needed to increase in their favor with God. Now listen, it says of Jesus in the, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, I think it is, it says he increased in favor with God and man. If Jesus, who was perfect, needed to increase in favor with God and man, then we certainly do. So many people never reach their potential or their, their assignment in life because they didn't realize their need for favor. Now, let's make it clear. God loves us all the same, but not all of us have the same measure of favor. That's not punishment. That's the mercy of God because favor creates opportunity. And he only wants to create opportunity in the measure that we can handle responsibly. But here's the inviting thing is that every person's favor can increase by using what they have well. So here's what this says. A good man obtains favor, and it's contrasted with a man with evil motives, evil intentions. So what's the point? A good person is defined in this verse as a person with pure motives that wants to do right things. That person actually attracts the favor of God. So it might be worthwhile to just, in, in your computer or iPad or whatever, <clears throat> highlight the word favor and just look at every time the word favor is mentioned in Proverbs. It's, it's a rich, rich lesson. All right, let's move on over to verse 14. Uh, it says, A man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth, and the recompense of a man's hands will be rendered to him. A man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. I've, I've, I've pondered, meditated <clears throat> on that verse before, that a person will be satisfied with good. It's describing like eating a meal. It's describing like uh, at the end of a wonderful meal, you, you just, you're so thankful and satisfied and appreciated from what you just had. Here he's saying that satisfaction can come by the words that come out of your mouth that you actually, your, your speech determines what you're going to be eating. Your speech, what you and I say to one another, what we say to that person who, who um, looks like they're not doing well in life, but we have that moment to speak to them, those words determine our meal. They determine what we're going to be feeding on. 
And oftentimes we miss the opportunity or we speak incorrectly towards a person, just a vent, instead of to really say what the Lord is saying to them. And when we do that, we end up with a dissatisfied soul because we're having to eat in life. We're having to eat from the table we just spread. So there's an encouragement for you. Look for the people that need words of strength and encouragement and speak that to them. Move on down to verse 17. He who speaks truth declares righteousness, but a false witness deceit. There's one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. There's an interesting phase, phrase. The tongue of the wise promotes health. Now, this I, I don't get this yet. I, I all I know all I know is that month after month I go through the book of Proverbs and it always stands out to me how often speech affects health. Speech affects health. We should get it. it says life and death is in the power of the tongue. How often we have said, oh, what a, I'm so dumb. Why did I do that? <clears throat> we, we say things our body doesn't recognize when we're joking. Our body doesn't recognize when we are <clears throat> just, just trying to be light, random. There's life and death in the power of the tongue, and the tongue promotes health, and that's the Word of God. And uh, elsewhere, it talks about that the life actually flows from our speech. And so I want to encourage you here, the tongue of the wise. So it's words of wisdom promotes health. My goodness, every family, members of a family, determined to speak words of wisdom in that household actually increases the level of health experienced in that family, in that business, in that church. <clears throat> Move on down to Verse 24, I just, I like whenever I see the word diligence because there's that extra effort involved. It says the hand of the diligent will rule. <clears throat> That's true. Those who put in the extra effort are always the ones that are promoted. And then we're going to get down to verse 25, a scary verse to me. It says anxiety in the heart of a man causes depression. So many people, so many believers are just struggling you know, painfully with depression, with discouragement constantly. I, I used to be a big battle for me all the time. I'd always compare myself and never, never came up good. And uh, anxiety is what weighs the heart down and gives way to depression. So here it is, anxiety in the heart causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. <clears throat> Sometimes that good word is spoken by us to ourselves. You know, the Bible says, let the weak say, I am strong. So what does that mean? So in this moment where I feel weak, I'm declaring over myself, I'm strong. I am strong. Sometimes that good word that we need to hear actually needs to come out of our own mouth. And I want to encourage you, anxiety in the heart causes depression. A good word makes it glad. <clears throat> Every one of us were designed to have hearts that were happy and filled with life, overflowing with joy. That's the design of the Lord for us. Part of that is stay away from anxiety. You learn to deal with fear effectively. You deal with fear by coming into the Word of God to find out what He says. And then the good Word makes the heart glad. I bless you with that. I pray that that would be your portion, your experience in this coming week. We're going to keep talking about the mouth in chapter 13. Join us. Every person has within reach abundant resources to make their life fulfilling, every person. I don't care what continent, I don't care where they live, what nation they live in, what economy they live in, there is a relative abundance within reach of every person. But the problem is there's a lot of injustice, and injustice keeps people from being able to access what God has made available to them. Well, hello again. Welcome. Glad uh, that you could join us. So we're going to look at uh, chapter 13 of Proverbs again. We are on this quest for wisdom. We are on this quest to learn how to reign in life in a way that brings glory to God 
and establishes family lines for multiple generations that openly testify of God's goodness. So here in chapter 13, it starts by saying, a man, verse 2, excuse me, a man shall eat well by the fruit of his mouth. We ended last session with that same concept, that our speech determined what we fed on. So here it is, a man shall eat well by the fruit of his mouth, the soul of the unfaithful feed, feeds on violence. He who guards his mouth preserves his life. He who guards his mouth preserves his life. I, I love the verse that says, um, even a fool when he's kept silent is thought to be wise. So, so when in doubt, just don't say anything uh, because it, it, uh, it keeps us from over speaking and actually bringing calamity into our own life. Let's move on down to verse 13. It's one of the most important verses for me in the last probably 20, 30 years, 30 years, is uh, verse 13 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. A New American Standard, I think, says, when desire is realized, it is a tree of life. So think through this one. This one is worthy of a, of a whole session easily. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. What does that mean? <clears throat> it doesn't mean that when you face disappointment, you're automatically thrust into some emotional calamity. It just means you're vulnerable. It means you're vulnerable. And in that place of vulnerability, you have to make right choices. <clears throat> because mourning can take you of one of two places. Mourning will either take you to the comforter, blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted, or mourning will take you to unbelief. And that's where we have to be careful when there's disappointment because there's that sense of loss. Uh, things didn't work out the way we expected them to. We we're vulnerable in those positions. That's why it says it makes the heart sick. It opens you up to a vulnerability spiritually that's not healthy. So just realize what's going on. Take charge of your own heart, your own thoughts, uh, your own prayer life, your own confession, your decree over your own life, and make sure you're saying the things that will nourish your soul. So here it is, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But this next part is exciting for me. It says, but desire realized is a tree of life. <clears throat> the tree of life is in three books of the Bible. It's in the book of Genesis. It's in the book of Proverbs. It's in the book of Revelation. One way I like to look at it, Genesis talks about what was. Revelation talks about what will be. But Proverbs talks about the tree of life that's here and now. The tree of life helps to establish and define our eternal purpose here in this life. So when it talks about a tree of life, we're not talking about just some random fruit. We're talking about something that in the Garden of Eden, the angel actually protected Adam and Eve from eating it after they sinned because it would mark their life of sin as their eternal um, condition. So it marks with eternity whatever it touches. So that's interesting because it says, the tree of life is connected to a desire realized. What does that say? It's saying that you and I were designed to be dreamers and that our assignment in co-laboring with the Lord is to be so completely yielded to him that he could trust us with our dreams and to watch those dreams get fulfilled <clears throat> because that is our connection to our eternal purpose. You and I will reign with Christ for all eternity. We're not gonna be sitting on clouds playing harps. God, has, uh, heaven is a very industrious place and we have responsibilities there. Desire realized is actually training for eternity. Wow. Let's move on. It says uh, over here, uh, verse, uh, excuse me, verse, oh, verse 17, sorry, almost missed an important one. It said, a wicked messenger falls into trouble but a faithful ambassador brings health. There it is again. Health is connected to a faithful messenger. A faithful messenger has a message, has a decree, has a proclamation. One of the best things you and I can do is to listen continuously to the words of truth as they actually impact our soul, our mind, which impacts our entire physical body and health. So I encourage you in that. And then let's walk right down here to the last verse for today. And it is verse 23. It's a very, very important verse. Much food is in the fallow or hard ground of the poor. And the lack of justice, there's waste. 
I think, again, it's New American says, um, and um, injustice keeps the wealth separate from the sinner. Injustice keeps it from them. So let's go through it again. I, I, I need to say it clearer. Much food is in the fallow ground of the poor. What is that telling us? <clears throat> Every person has within reach abundant resources to make their life fulfilling. Every person. I don't care what continent. I don't care where they live in, in the, what nation they live in, what economy they live in. There is a relative abundance within reach of every person. But the problem is there's a lot of injustice. And injustice keeps people from being able to access what God has made available to them. Now, here's where you and I come in. <clears throat> Jesus gave us authority. And one of the primary purposes of authority is to deal with injustice. It's to speak on behalf of those who have little to no voice. For example, um, abortion is the classic example. That infant has no voice. Somebody has to speak for that child that is in the womb who desires life, who desires length of days. They, have, they already have emotions. They already have the mind is working. They're being prepared to live on this planet in a purposeful way, and yet abortion kills them. And somebody's got to speak on behalf of those who have no voice. That's what authority does. Authority addresses the issues of injustice. Sometimes we will find people that have multiple generations of poverty. And it's just near impossible for them to get out of that. Somebody's got to come to them and to help them. Let me say this about, about poverty. Money will not fix poverty. But poverty will also not be fixed without money. So if you throw money at a problem, it doesn't, it doesn't fix it because they'll be back in the same issue again. Why? Because there's other factors involved. And true biblical justice restores a person to God's original intent and original design. And I believe the Lord's going to give us wisdom in this next season where we can take some of, some of our beloved members of our cities that have been so locked in poverty for so long, multiple generations, and come alongside and nurture, a desire, a disciple, a develop, challenge, provide, give opportunity to see that injustice broken so that they can tap the resource, the abundant resource that God designed for them that's right within reach. That's my prayer. That's my prayer that you, that together we would be a people that care correctly about the injustices of this world and with divine authority come and bring solutions. So I bless you with that. I pray that, uh, that you and I will thrive with creative ideas and how to serve people that are just locked up in poverty, that they would taste God's abundance. Amen. Bless you.